Once upon a time, there was an old grapevine. It had been growing in a vineyard for a long time. One day, a new branch was established in the next row. This younger branch grew. It developed more branches and bore fruit. And one hot summer day, the young branch looked up at the old branch and he said in its, in its squeaky voice, it must be great to have people travel for miles around just to taste the, the sweet, abundant uh, fruit that grows. I've been talking with the other branches and they say that yours is the sweetest fruit. And the old branch smiled. And the young branch went on to say, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. How can I have sweet fruit like yours? I'll do anything you say. As the old branch looked down on the young branch, he remembered the day when, as a young branch himself, he asked an old branch that same question. And in his baritone voice, he gave the same answer that he received years earlier. Two words. Be willing. And the young branch mused in frustration, thinking over those words, be willing. I'll tell him I'll do whatever it takes to have his uh, abundant and sweet fruit. And all he says is, be willing. Some months later, one cool autumn morning, the young branch was awakened by the sound of the old uh, weathered gate into the vineyard opening. And as he looked, in stepped the gardener. But normally when the gardener came to visit, the vines would clap their hands, their, le their leaves together like hands, and they would shout with delight. But something unusual was taking place on this day. A hush swept over the garden. And the young branch glanced over at the old branch, but he didn't seem disturbed. And as he looked, the gardener stopped by the first branch in the row. He bent down on one knee, he reached into his back pocket, and he pulled out what looked like sharp scissors, and he moved toward his friend. Instantly, that branch pulled her leaves back, and the young branch heard her plead, No, no, wh why are you doing this to me? Haven't I been bearing fruit? Please, please, don't do this to me. Before the young branch could blink, his friend lay on the ground, except for the nub. The young branch struggled to understand what was happening. I mean, it all seemed so confusing. And then the young branch blurted out, how could the gardener do that? Why did he do that? Why? The old branch said, this is what happens to all those the gardener is caring for. He does it. He does it to bring greater yield of his crop next year. His pruning isn't because he, he doesn't care. In fact, it's because he does care. And so when the gardener comes to prune you, young branch, remember that he only prunes the branches that belong to him. And the reason that he prunes you is that he wants you to, he wants your fruit to be more abundant and sweeter next year. He wants you to grow more fruit. Sometime later, the gardener entered again into the vineyard. He stopped by the old branch. And the young branch saw the old branch raise his leaves high in the air. He heard a snip, and the old branch lay on the ground, except for the nub. The gardener then turned to the younger branch. His leaves were shaking. Tears were rolling down his side. But with every ounce of strength that was in his sap, he raised his leaves high. He looked up into the gardener's face and he said, Kind and gentle gardener, I'm willing. That story sets the scene of this morning's sermon, which is entitled, Pruned to Bloom. And we're going back to John 15, verses 1 to eight. You see, friends, it's one thing for us to consider, as we did last Lord's Day, that Christ is sovereign over all things, that he's ruling and reigning now. That, that does give us comfort when life gets tough. We saw that last week. To know that Christ reigns above, that brings hope to us. But how do we understand times of real trial below, down here, where we live. 
Why does God allow such, such things to happen to us? Let me personalize that. How do you go? How do you handle trials? When work becomes really tough, or when there's a terminal illness of someone near you, or when there are troubles at home, or maybe it's in those times when you are experiencing such uncertainty and grief that you're tempted to question God. You're tempted to question His love. You're tempted to question His sovereignty. How can God allow this? How can such times as these be good for me? Why? Well, John chapter 15 has many things to say, friends, and it, out of its many things, it has something to say in answer to that question. There are three aspects of this passage, the first eight verses here, that I'd like to underscore for us this morning as we work our way through them. And the three things that we're going to look at is the vitality of the true branch, the clarity of the true branch, and lastly, the prosperity of the true branch. Let's think firstly as we come back to John 15 about the vitality of the true branch. And you know where we are in New Testament history. You know where we are when we're in John 15. As we open up John 15, Jesus is continuing what he's been saying in the upper room the very night before he dies. They've just celebrated the, the, the Passover. Jesus has instituted the Lord's Supper. This is the last opportunity to teach his disciples before they go out in a little while into, over the brook Kidron outside Jerusalem and over into the, uh, into the Garden of Gethsemane where Judas would betray our Lord Jesus, where Jesus would be arrested, where Jesus then would be taken to his mock trial and that very next morning Jesus would be put to death. And that's the context in which Jesus says in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. When Jesus launches into this picture, into this parable, when he says, I am the true vine, those men in the upper room who are listening to Jesus, they, they had in their mind, they, they're out of, coming out of a culture where this expression was something they immediately understood. Palestine's filled with vineyards. On so many hills around Jerusalem, there would have been uh, vineyards planted and vineyards growing. The entire grape industry, we might say, was, was a very large part of their culture. And so what Jesus is, is about to describe in this analogy is something that they very well understood and could relate to. And so here's the setup then. Jesus says, I am the true vine. This is who I am. I'm the true vine. Now, many times, many places in the Old Testament, Israel is described as God's vine. But how disappointing that vine had been. It failed again and again and again to, to bear or to yield true fruit for the Lord. Jesus came, you see, to establish what Israel could never achieve. Jesus would be the true vine. And he would ensure that there would be much fruit on his vine. Every one of his disciples will bear fruit. And so Israel in the flesh could not bear fruit on their vine. But the true vine will supernaturally produce fruit in his people's life. Jesus also says there in verse 1 that his father is the vine dresser. So he he. he if you like, fills out the picture. The vine dresser, that's God the Father. He's the, he's the owner of the vineyard. He cares for what is growing in his field. He's like the, the farmer. He tends, he, he keeps his garden, ensuring that it's going to yield well. You go down to verse 5, there's then this other aspect as he fills out the picture. He says in verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. And so here's the simple description. The vine is Christ. The vine dresser is the Father. And I suggest you, professed believers are the branches of the vine. Now, six times in the scope of a few verses here, Jesus speaks of the need for the branches to abide in Him. 
Just come back to the passage. Let's read a few verses and you'll see how this jumps out. Verse 4. Look for the times it says abiding in Christ. Verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. Without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me. If you didn't pick it up, <laughs> you, you, you were just asleep. Had a little nanny nod for a couple of moments there. It's clear, is it not? Jesus is making this emphatically clear some half a dozen times. He's speaking about the need for the branches to abide in him. In other words, the branches must be connected. They must be attached to the vine. Why? Because the vine possesses vitality. That is, the vine is full of life. It's full of sap, the sap of energy, the sap of strength. The, the vine is the living plant. It, it sap flows, as it were, into the branches. The branches cannot survive on their own. They must be attached to the vine. And so the vine is life-giving. The vine is fruit-producing. There is no life apart from the vine. And here's sim the simple but crucial point we need to underscore right now. That without the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have life. You personally and I personally must be connected to Jesus Christ. You don't have life if you don't have Christ. You may have existence. You, you actually have an empty, meaningless existence. But, but only those who have Christ have true life. You may be part of a Christian family. You may be part of a Christian church, you may have some connections to Christian schooling, but to not have the life of Christ in you is meaning you don't have life. What's his life like? His life is true life. He's the true vine. His life is abundant life. His life is supernatural life. His life is spiritual life. His life is eternal life. I am the true vine. Abide in me. And so here we need to see the sufficiency and the vitality of the life-giving Lord Jesus Christ. All who are His true disciples then, all who are the true branches, they are the ones who are connected to the true vine. They abide in Him and they must abide in Him. They must rely on His grace. They must uh, rest in His provision. They must remain in His presence. Three R's, that little trilogy. That's not original to me. I, I borrowed that from someone else. It was so good, I thought I've got to use that. I think it captures something of what it means to abide in Christ. Relying on His grace. Resting in His provision. Being those who are remaining in His presence. And so to abide in Christ is to attach ourselves to Christ. It is cling to Him. It is, if you like, to draw from Him all that we need for life and eternity. It is relying. It is resting. It is remaining in Him. So, whatever may be happening in your life today, think about this for you personally. Whatever demands, perhaps, are pressing down upon you, and maybe they feel that they, they're almost impossible for you to handle. This vine ever possesses the fullest supply of the sap of grace for you, Christian friend. The Lord Jesus can supernaturally enable you to do anything, actually to do everything in the will of God. Are there any spouses here this morning who need to hear this word? Are there any parents here today who are feeling the weight of your responsibility? Think of this. All the wisdom that you need in raising your children in a God-honoring way, in a decaying culture, all that you need is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Are there any young people here this morning who need the power and the courage of the Lord to remain strong and not crumble under the pressure of the world around you or upon you? Are there any discouraged here this morning who need the sovereign supernatural encouragement of the Lord? Are there any here this morning who are feeling the immense weakness that you have in face, in the face of a strong temptation to sin? Christ the vine is sufficient. All the life flowing power and grace to live God honoring fruit bearing lives comes from Christ and Christ alone. He is the vitality of the true branch. And any attempt for us to go and find it somewhere else always ends in barrenness. Second thing I draw your attention to is we come now to verse 2, and that's the clarity of the true branch. The clarity of the true branch. Look at verse 2 with me. Every branch in me, Jesus says... Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Now here Jesus is mentioning two types of branches. You can see it, it's right there on the surface of the text. There's, there's one type of branch that doesn't bear fruit. And then he speaks of another type of branch that does bear fruit. And in one sense or another, these branches are attached to Christ the vine. He uses the expression, they are in me. But now look at verse 6. This is where it gets interesting. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Now, this, this particular verse has led some people, many people perhaps, to think that Jesus is saying that you can be a branch, that you can be saved, and then you can fall away and you can lose your salvation. Is that what Jesus is saying here? Now, I think if you just read verse 6 in isolation... And if you ignore the context, you, you could think that Jesus is saying that you can lose your salvation. You could think that. But friends, I want to make this as clear as I can. I will state it up front and then I'll hopefully show you why what I'm saying is true. Jesus is not teaching in verse 6 that you can lose your salvation. Did you understand my words? Now, as we've often said, don't believe because I said, we need to see this as a scriptural understanding. Jesus is not teaching that you can lose your salvation here. This is actually one of those times when we need to go to some clearer passages where there is an abundance of light and allow the light, the, the abundance of light in those other passages to beam back on this passage to help us understand it. It's an aspect of interpreting the scripture, what I've just explained to you. Our confession actually outlines that for us. You see, here's the thing. If Jesus is really saying in verse 6 that Christians can lose their salvation, then he has either forgotten or he is blatantly contradicting what he said earlier in John's gospel. Turn with me to chapter 10. John chapter 10 and verse 27. However vague or confusing you may find verse 6 of chapter 15, you don't have that experience when you come into chapter 10 from verse 27 through to 30. Let's read it. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's, that's actually enough for me. I don't think we even need to go any further. The sheep of Christ always hear his voice and they follow him. They follow him. It's a pattern of their life. They follow him. 
They don't follow him for a while, then stop following him and therefore are not Christian. They hear his voice and they follow him. But let's keep reading because it does become even clearer. Verse 28, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I am my Father are how many? One. I and my Father are one. Let's turn to chapter 6. If that's not enough for you, <laughs> let's turn to chapter 6. Just for one verse here, verse 37. Again, notice the Lord Jesus is speaking. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Ever. All those who come in faith to Christ, saving faith to Christ, all those that the Father has given to the Son to save all the lost sheep, all of them will never be cast out. All of those who come to Christ in faith are safe. So whatever Jesus is saying, if we go back to chapter 15 and verse 6, he is clearly not saying that Christians can lose their salvation unless he's forgotten what he's just said in those earlier chapters or contradicts himself. And I'm not happy to say that that's the case. I believe the understanding in John, in, in John chapter 15 of Jesus' words is cleared up when we consider the immediate context. So I've taken you to the broader context in just a couple of places and there would have been a, a proliferate of other verses we could have done. But let's think about the immediate context because it, it resolves it, I believe. As Jesus speaks these words in John 15, who's he speaking to? He's speaking to his 11 disciples. Yes, 11. Because at the time when he speaks in chapter 15, Jesus has already left the room. That happened back in chapter 13 and verse 30 where it says, And then he immediately went out and it was night. Judas went out into the dark night to do his dark deed of betrayal of the Lord Jesus. But what about Judas? Clearly, Judas appeared like a true branch to all his friends. Remember, they had no idea that he was the one in the upper room that Jesus was actually referring to who, when he said that one of you will betray me. No one pointed the finger at Judas and said, oh, we all know it's him. No one knew it was him. In fact, to all of them, it was, it was, it was obvious it was not Judas. They thought he was a true disciple, in other words. And yet we know as the Gospels unfold, the Gospel accounts unfold, we now know as we've got this, you know, wisdom in hindsight, the Scripture record, we know that Judas was a hypocrite. Only a few minutes before Jesus speaks about a branch not bearing fruit and being taken away, Judas himself had work walked out of the upper room. Judas' life lacked the fruit of the Spirit, and Judas was taken away. Oh yes, Judas had a profession of faith. Yes, Judas was involved in serving Christ. Great service, spectacular service. He did miracles. But Judas lacked positive fruit. Because we know he was a sneaky thief. The vine dresser. Thinking of the analogy, the vine dresser does not tolerate a non-fruit bearing branch. The vine dresser cuts that branch off and that branch withers, Jesus says. All such fruitless branches, Jesus then says, are gathered together and those branches, those fruitless branches, are thrown into the fire. They're burned. Now think again of Judas. Surely Judas is very fresh in Jesus' mind as he says this in chapter 15. Very fresh. Judas, very quickly withered. 
You think as he went out and he does his deed and his conscience so smit him. He was so deeply troubled in his conscience. He was deeply remorseful, though he was not genuinely repentant. And we know, as, as Matthew 27 tells us, he went out and he hung himself. And that happened all before Jesus even got tried by Pilate the next morning. In Acts 1.25, it tells us that Judas went to his own place. Actually, in chapter 17 of John, in Jesus' prayer, he refers to Judas as the son of perdition. And so look back at chapter 15 and verse 6 and think of it in relation to Judas. That's the immediate context. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Within a few hours of Jesus saying those very words, Judas personally would enter the hellfire. This is real. You see, here's a sober warning of John 15. Fruitless branches are branches that are not savingly joined to Jesus Christ. Like Judas, such branches, all oh, they may have an outward appearance of being attached to the vine, but the lack of true fruit in their lives is the proof that they are not saved. No fruit of the Spirit. No spirit. No spiritual life. Where there is no regenerating work, of the Spirit, where there is no new heart given, where there is no saving faith, which is, which is the connection to the true vine, where there is no spiritual sap flowing into the, into the branch producing fruit. That's the branch that God will cut off. That's the branch that will wither. That's the branch that the Father gathers with other such branches. They are the branches that are thrown into the fire. And so, friends, here's the crucial thing for each of us this morning. There are many branches that have nothing but leaves and no true fruit. Is that you? Is that your life? Do you only have an outward attachment to Christ? Obviously, you have church attendance. You're here. You, you may have had baptism in your life. You may have connection with God's people. You may even be a member in Christ's church in terms of a local church. You may have engagement with service to Christ. Yes, indeed, like Judas, you may have a profession of faith that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, but is there fruit, true spiritual fruit in your life that is the fruit of, of personal holiness, the fruit of the Spirit as is listed in Galatians chapter 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control. You know... You can't manufacture those things. There might be some general sense in which someone says, oh, she, she or he's a joyful person. But in terms of Galatians 5's list, you can't manufacture the fruit of the Spirit. You can't, not in the flesh. You will have as much success at doing that as Israel did in the Old Testament or Judas did in the New Testament. And to help you see that, look at verse 4. Jesus says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. In other words, there must be this vital union with Christ. By faith, united to Christ in his death, in his burial. And in his resurrection, relying on his gracious work on the cross, resting in his provision, remaining in his presence, walking with him. May we all examine our hearts this morning and look into our lives and make sure that we are truly in the faith, that we are in Christ. 
Because all true branches, all true branches, every one of them have spiritual fruit in their lives. No fruit, though, and the vine dresser is coming to cut us off, to throw us into the hellfire. Which is why we need to listen and take on board Paul's words when Paul says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. He then says, test yourselves. Look for evidence that you pass this crucial eternal test. Lest, he says, you are disqualified. You don't pass the test. If there's no fruit on the vine, then you don't qualify for glory. You're not going to heaven. Whatever you profess, you're going to hell. But that doesn't need to be. By faith, united to Christ is where the sap of his energy and his life comes into the life of the sinner and so transforms us and gives us his spirit that then we have the fruit of the spirit. That's nothing about us. That's about the grace of God and the incredible faithfulness and love of God to his people. Thirdly and finally, the prosperity of the true branch. I hesitated whether to use the term prosperity because the term prosperity today has been abused, I think, in Christian circles and it's been hijacked <laughs> biblically. But no, I thought, no, that's a legitimate word. I'm going to use that word. The prosperity of the true branch. And why am I using that word? Well, let's come back to verse 2 for us to see it. Again, let's read it again. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch, you get that? Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. That it may be prosperous, if you will, in its fruit bearing. I believe this passage, this second half of verse 2, is of great help for true branches. It's of great help for true branches in all of life, but it's especially of great help for true branches in times of difficulty. It's especially helpful for us to understand pruning. Because of the way grapevines grow and produce fruit, growers must prune them annually. Because fruit is only produced on the growing one-year-old shoots. By the way, you know what they call those shoots? On the grapevine, they call them canes. C-A-N-E-S. They're tall, they're thin, they're skinny. I thought that's appropriate. That, that, that's, that's where the fresh new fruit comes. That's where the abundance of fruit comes. On those shoots that come because the vine, the, the branch has been pruned. In other words, no pruning. There's very little fruit coming. And so that's the whole point, isn't it not? That the purpose of the pruning is to obtain maximum yield of high quality grapes. That's the analogy. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus is speaking about true disciples. They are fruit bearing disciples. They are the ones that he prunes. Every one of them. And so if you are a true branch, if you are a true Christian, if you think that you can skid through Christian life with no pruning, with, with no trial, and just hoping that God doesn't notice that, the, that the, the vine dresser won't sneak into the garden and snip you, your hopes are in vain. Because Jesus said every branch is going to be pruned. And you haven't got to be a Christian too long. Before you realize that pruning is actually necessary in our spiritual lives. It's a hard one to swallow. Doesn't make us feel comfortable and easy. But the true Christian knows that it is what God uses to grow us spiritually. The Father removes sins. The Father removes superfluous things that limit our fruitfulness. In other words, He trims us back. And so when the, when the heavenly vine dresser gets out his spiritual secateurs and he snips away, we know that is never a comfortable experience. And one of the best ways to prune us 
is to allow suffering and problems to come into our lives. And our Father works with precision with his spiritual secateurs. And sometimes, as you know, sometimes it can really hurt. Sometimes it cuts very deep. And like the young branch in that opening story, in those times we can wonder, what is God doing? Why, Lord? Why? You know, spiritual pruning, I think, can take on a few different forms. It may happen via physical sickness. It may, it may happen due to some personal hardship, be uh, a physical one or a, a, an, a, an emotional one, a relational one, a financial one. It may come by way of persecution. It may come by way of slander from other people, from the world. It could be in the form of deep trials in the family. It could be a grief in a relationship. It may be some tragedy. But whatever form it comes, all true branches know the feeling of pruning. You know the pain of pruning if you're a Christian. You don't need me to explain that to you, articulate that to you. You know it. It is so important, though, that we understand what our heavenly vine dresser is doing. It's so important that we understand that He does actually care for us. That in that process, He's actually doing that so that we might produce more fruit in our lives. He's trimming off that which is actually draining us of spiritual energy. He's a good gardener. He loves us enough to trim those things out of our lives that are actually not necessary as we might think they are. But he knows they have to be removed. In John 15, at this point at least, Jesus is helping us, I believe, to have a proper perspective on trials in our lives. And don't we all need this? I mean, I, I need to preach this to myself. Don't, don't you need this? A, a reminder, if not, or a, a clearer understanding, a, a right perspective of trials in your life as a Christian? You see, despite what some try and teach today, God actually brings difficulties in our lives so that we would yield more fruit. This passage alone shows that Jesus, He is not out to give us constant wealth, constant health, and a long, long life on this earth of peacefulness. We want a life of ease. I get that. <laughs> I understand that. We want a comfortable life. And he wants a fruitful life. And it's only the fruit that comes after some heavy pruning. You see, the father doesn't always just fertilize. The father doesn't always just water. Sometimes the father opens the squeaky gate and he reaches for his back pocket and he snips away in our lives with his spiritual pruning scissors. And you know what that is, friends? That is clear evidence of a father who loves. You say, that's love? Well, according to the Bible's own understanding of what happens, it is because Hebrews chapter 12 says, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Yes, the pruning process can hurt, but he knows what he is doing. Hebrews says, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, he says, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. The peaceable fruit of righteousness. Now, what's the fruit of righteousness? Well, I've said this quickly in passing. Surely it's, it's in one way to describe that is Galatians 5. One way to talk about the fruit is the fruit of the Spirit. But I think there's even evidence in John 15 of some of this fruit that the Father is producing with this pruning. Quickly look with me. Verse 7, there's the fruit of answered prayer. 
If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Ask what you want, and God will give it. Now that verse has been very badly abused by Christians. Because they take the second half of the verse and they don't see the condition. Abide in me, he says, and have my word abiding in you. So have the word of God filtering through your life and so changing the way that you think and permeating your ideas and your perspectives so that the kingdom of God priority becomes your priority and the things that you are thinking are truly the very revealed will of God and you therefore will ask God the very thing that God will definitely give you. Whatever you ask will give. That's the fruit of answered prayer. There's others here. Just quickly, verse 9. There's the, there's the fruit of love. As the Father loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. Oh, basking in the love of God. The very love that is in the Godhead is the love that we experience. That's the fruit of love. Verse 11 surely is the fruit of joy. These things I've spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Whose joy is it? It's my joy. <coughs> Jesus has got joy and he knows he's about to be betrayed and he knows what's coming tomorrow. Jesus has got joy when he as a human is about to experience the worst thing a human will ever experience on planet Earth. Yep. We talk about being happy. Happy, 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 happy. That's not the same thing as joy. Jesus has joy. My joy will be in you. My joy will be. It's a fruit. Love and joy, well, they're in Galatians 5 anyway, so we see the overlap here. This is the fruit that, that's going to be on the lives of those who the Father, the vine dresser, prunes. How does he do that? Well, I've suggested he uses trials, but as real as God uses troubles in our lives to prune us, I don't think that's primarily the thing that he mentions in the passage. And so my last point is to turn you to verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. I turn you to that because the word that's used in English, clean, is actually the same Greek word that's translated elsewhere in the passage as prune. It's the same word. The father prunes by the use of his word. It's certainly the case that the father uses troubles. But think about it, Christian friend. The Father uses troubles to make us more sensitive to the Word. How often have you not experienced that? It's when you're in the middle of a trial that there's a portion of Scripture that becomes personal and precious to you in a way that when life is easy, you never even saw it. Charles Spurgeon put it this way, it's the Word that prunes the Christian. Affliction is the handle of the knife. Affliction makes us ready to feel the word. And the true pruning is the word in the hand of the great vine dresser. He goes on to say, it's the word coming to us while in affliction that purges us. Affliction, he says, is only the handle in the knife in the hand of the vine dresser. We do the full circle, we come back as we conclude to where we started with that story and let me ask you the question. Are you like the old branch in the story? Or even like the younger one toward the end of the story? That is, are you yielding in your heart? How do you respond to trials? Or maybe it's this question, how are you responding to God pruning you? Are you resisting him? That that difficulty that you are facing as a true branch could actually be his pruning work. Don't fight with him, Christian friend, because you'll never win. Yield to him. Submit to His sovereign and loving will for your life. He knows what He is doing. He's actually using it to grow you and to produce true fruit in your life. 
What's the end result of that pruning? Let's look at verse 8 as we finish then. What's the end result of the pruning? By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. Bearing fruit doesn't make you a disciple. Bearing fruit proves that you are already a disciple, but the ultimate end in producing much more fruit is what? Is so that the Father is glorified. That's verse 8. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. May God give us yielding hearts. May God give us much of His spiritual sap that we may honour Him and glorify Him in our lives. Let's pray. Oh, our great eternal God, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for the clarity of your words. We thank you for the wisdom that you possessed to tell your disciples this while you had an opportunity, that they, with us, might understand and be able to interpret with such perspectives from your lips when we as Christians go through difficult times, we ask that you would give us the grace to be submissive, the grace, Lord, to be submissive when things are very difficult, the grace to be submissive when things are really uncertain, the grace to be submissive when we ask for something and you say no. Grant us your spirit that we may not just be hearers of your word, but doers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.